So when did the Rangels become a, a, a unit? Like, uh, and uh, what what happened that you decided to go from uh, the uh, the Al group until the the Rangels? How did that all come about? Oh boy. Uh, we had the TV show for a while. There was some changes. There's always, as always happens, members change back and forth. And uh, the TV show stayed as a CK Ranch Party, I think. And there was another man called Hank Secord, who was also he was a DJ on a radio station, but he also did some of his own song and had put out a record. So <clears throat> he joined the band too. And he was instrumental because he worked for the same radio station that had the TV station. He was instrumental in getting a new TV show going. And uh, that's the one I think was called CK Ranch Party, but I can't remember. You know, there's too many things. Yeah, that's a, that's a long time ago. Yeah. So, uh, did, did it work out that eventually the Rainvilles became the main, the, the header act for the CK Ranch Party? Well, we, about 19. Not really, no. It was always a group. There was nobody that it was... It was a variety show. It things. was a variety show. Okay. Nobody was featured any more than another. Uh, it was just a nice group, you know, of people who would join together. Uh, <clears throat> but in about uh, then, there was too many of us. What was happening is the show was good. We were doing the show, but we were split in about three bands doing our own thing. So we had a piano player that played with us. In fact, it's the same plan piano player that we found on a, on a 1964 uh, song. Uh, his name was Johnny Valley. So what happened is him, my wife and I, started performing our own shows, our dances. We would hire a, <clears throat> a drummer, to, you know, different drummer each time to play with us. But we started uh, doing our own, whereas another group of the two or three of the others would form their own group. So there was about three groups out of that gang that were performing. There was a lot of demand. And then at that exact time, around 63 or so, the lounges became available. So when that happened, we started playing the lounges a lot. Okay. Now, who, who did you have an agent at the time, or were you booking your own acts? No, we were booking our own. Um, when we left Sudbury, um, the reason I left Sudbury then too, also, I was, a, I was offered a job as a, as a guitar teacher in St. Catharines, Ontario. So we, that's when the show ended. We, we left Sudbury to go uh, so I could study the guitar, uh, study the teaching method of guitar so I could uh, have a different job, which was a better paying job at the time. Yeah. Now, you, did you have a, 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 any uh, a pro professional designation as a, as a, as a music teacher? Um, well, I had been, I knew enough guitar that I and I, I had learned the music by note also by myself. So when I went to St. Catharines, um, actually the, uh, the college, music college was in uh, Burlington. But after about the three months of study, so I could improve and learn their method, then they sent me out around the uh, peninsula to teach guitar in different studios. Okay, uh, schools or a, a school? A, it was no, it was a, a private uh, music. Uh, oh, private, a private music uh, music company. Okay, okay. It was called the Canadian Academy of Music, if I okay. remember right. Uh, so, would you do home visits, like if you wanted? No, no, no. In in studios, they would rent a studio, and I would teach a group of about eight or ten or twelve people. Okay, okay. And uh, then we started. My wife was working also, but we started performing. We found some musicians there, and we started performing. At night, at night, in St. Catharines, in St. all over St. Catharines, well in Niagara Falls, and we were in quite quite in demand. So before we knew it, by 1967, we decided there was we I couldn't teach anymore. There was too much demand for playing, so we we were in demand every night. So we were start we we decided to go on the road <coughs> as the Rainvilles. We had been called the Rainvilles since that since we moved to St. Catharines. We decided to go on the road as a four-piece group. There, we had an agent booking us in different parts of, the, of Ontario, Quebec, and in northern states. Uh, okay, so uh, how many uh, how many days out of the year would you be uh, uh, have a gig? Was it uh, was it like a full-time job? For oh yeah, you? we were gigging. At, <clears throat> we were booked ahead. We were played every week. We had the booking in different areas. We'd be moving sometimes. Four or five hundred miles apart, but we would drive to the other place, 
play the week or two, whatever was booked, and then move on to the next uh, club. Okay. Now, uh, for for your own recording, uh, your own recording career, what came first, your recordings with the Rainvilles? Is that? Uh... That's right. In fact, it matches. This is why this all happened. In 1967, we recorded our first single, and to to help push the single, that's when we went on the road. I forgot about that. But that's one of the reasons why we went on the road, to help push the single also. And it was going up on the charts in RPM Weekly, so that helped a lot in the promotion. Okay. Now I know the, the title of the single, but can you tell a little bit about the single, uh, the single itself and uh, the promotion of that? And I'll let you tell the story. Well, the single was called I Got What I Wanted. It was not our own song, but uh, <clears throat> the company that we were recording for. Actually, we paid the, the session, but they did the promotion. It was called Red Leaf Label, or Red Leaf. Um, they did the promotion, they promoted very well, so our record went up the charts. We recorded four songs in 64, spring 64, and uh, only like one was released with a flip side, and it reached number one. <clears throat> and I got what I wanted. Yeah, it reached number one in July of 67, um, it, can it, that was number one in Canadian country at that time. The, the RPM chart was only for Canadian artists. They didn't combine all the artists, or like all everything. Uh, do you recall how many pressings of that record were made? I have no idea. They were they were handling that part. Uh, did did the record sell at all besides the chart? It was selling, but we 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 weren't really involved with that part. We just paid the session, and it was there because they were promoting. They handled all that part, so. How many pressings they did? Uh, we had we had a deal. Our job was more like we were playing. We were making a fairly decent living playing music. So they, I probably they were a very small company. So they needed the if it sold, they needed the dollars from the sales. So we never got any royalty or asked for. Now, now the flip side of that record, it's all your fault. Did that do any charting at all, or that was just the piece? Of it? <clears throat> it was only in the other side. So it, no, there was only one song charting. Um, at that time, they would not, they would never chart the two sides. Like about five, five or eight years before in Billboard, they would chart, both sides would chart if they were got airplay. But after, at that time, they were only charting the one side. Can you talk about the the Carl Smith TV show? And uh, I I know you got that particular gig due to the fact that, uh, due to the success of, um, I got what I wanted. Can you tell That's a little right, bit about yeah. that, please? Yeah, we were called, um, I don't remember the name of the bookers who called us, but asked us to appear on that show because of that uh, booking. It, it was called uh, Country Music Hall. I believe it was CTV, and I believe they were fairly new. CTV it was, had started not long before that, and their new show on country was called Country Music Hall, and it featured Carl Smith, who was a very big star at that time in the States and featured always a couple of, uh, two or three American artists and maybe two or three Canadian artists. So we appeared on that show and did a couple of songs. Uh, I think we did, uh, if I remember right, we did, uh, uh, we did I Got What I Wanted, I remember that. And uh, I can't remember the other song. That's like, I want to ask you, did you do that song live? Because you know, when I look a lot, I look back at a lot of these old TV shows, it all seems to be lip syncing to me. Did, it was, was all it? done live, yes. Okay, so you didn't just lip sync to your record? No, no, we sang it live. Okay. Yeah, if we made a mistake, uh, they would get. Uh, I remember one of the bands, Canadian band, made a mistake in his song and asked to restart, and they really got mad at him because they were, they were busy and they didn't have a lot of time. They should have learned their songs, and they were pretty mean to him. Okay, so when you, when you did, I got what I wanted for the Carl Smith show. Uh, was there a four piece band? In, uh, was the whole band? The whole the. the yeah, Carl Smith's band, band was behind, yeah. Oh, I see. Carl Smith was backing you up. Yeah, right? well, not him, but his band. So whoever band, whatever band they had that's on the show. Oh, okay. So they had, to, they had to learn that song within, well, yeah. the, within the course of the But those hour. musicians can learn it pretty quick. Okay. Okay, now after you, know, after you had that single uh, of uh, I Got What I Wanted, uh, when, when did uh, Melbourne Records come into the picture? That came in uh, 1970. And that was due to that also. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons we did not put out a second, second single also after the, uh, I got what I wanted is the company wanted us to travel across Canada. And we, we had our young family. 
So I thought we weren't going to leave our young family, like we wanted to be close to home. So when we went and did a job, we could come back each time and have a week off every so often. So um, what, <clears throat> what happened in between, we were on the road with a four-piece band and a booking agent for only about a year and a half. And then we, uh, we decided instead, we had, it was hard sometimes, with, we had two young guys, bass and drums, and one of them was sometimes moody, and sometimes he was in a very bad mood, he didn't feel like playing, and we were like, we, we kind of felt like babysitters at times, they were fairly young, so I th my wife and I said, you know what, I'll get a 12 string guitar, and she'd get a drum, set of drums, standing up drum, and we went as a duo. We also found out that we could make a lot more money as a duo than as a four, as a four piece. So now we started booking ourselves. I became the agent, and because we had a record, uh, because we had a, a record of being uh, Wish liked time. liked in the places we had played, we had no trouble booking ourselves back in. So we were starting to book ourselves um, very very steady. Like we, we in the spring we would like in January we would phone and book ourselves for the whole summer. And we had arranged it so we would <clears throat> take our kids with us in the summer. So we, during the summertime, we'd book in resorts or in a place where we could have the kids for the two and a half months and swimming and everything. Uh, was it who, who looked out for the kids when you weren't uh, when you were on the road with them? We had my parents. Uh, one of them would be at my parents. But what we did once we went on the road with. When we were on the road for the first year, we found that very hard to be away from the kids. So what we did, we would book ourselves to take two weeks playing, one week off, and then two weeks playing locally. So we'd come home every night. So we ended up being only away from home about two weeks out of every, not even two, two weeks out of every month, two weeks out, out of every two months. So it was like a holiday. The kids would get a holiday from us for, <laughs> A week or two, and but we we had it arranged that way, <clears throat> and then we, like I said, we started building our house. So we uh, we arranged it so we'd go, we take two weeks on and one off, two weeks on, one off. And while we were a week off, we would build on the house. In 1970, uh, George Taylor from Melbourne Records sent us a letter because of our uh, we were promoting a lot, even though we weren't. Uh, we, weren't re we had not recorded another single right away. We were still buying ads in RPM Weekly every so often to promote ourselves, to let people know where we were playing. And George Taylor, I think, liked the fact that we were so aggressive in what we are doing, so he approached us to record us. You know, what was your first release from our Yeah, The first one was uh, Fortunate Son, uh, which was a Creedence Clearwater song. And like I said, that reached about number 12 for us in the Canadian country charts, top 50. And the flip side of that was called a song that Dot wrote called Too Much In Love, a very slow ballad. Okay, I believe the Rainville's album came out, the first one came out at around the time of, or right after our second release, uh, wrote a song <clears throat> back with, with uh, Bootleg. The next one was called uh, when we tried, it was a Jan Jan Howard song she had done as a duet, and I can't recall the flip side of that one. Okay. Now I want to ask you: Were you uh, what was involved with the signing? Were you paid anything for signing this record, or or, or, or is it just a case that uh, these people would subsidize some of your cost of? Uh... Yeah, they paid <clears throat> they paid us a royalty on our sales of record, but. Um, the way it worked, and I, I hear, I've heard since then that it works for, in fact, George Jones was complaining about that not long ago. Uh, I remember still, the record was released and we were doing very well, and then we got a letter with a royalty check showing that the record had sold 2,800 units and our royalty was $19.50. Uh, they put down a, a list of costs of recording and tape and everything. Then the next, uh, <clears throat> the next uh, royalty check from them was around twenty dollars again, with a list of a few more things. And we started to say, "Ooh, there's a lot of new costs involved being involved." But we probably ended up making 
a hundred or two hundred dollars from that release just uh, on sales of it. But okay, so so really, uh, uh, the, the the release of these records in the early early times, the the, the money to be made was in live performance. I've always heard yep, it was live exactly. live performance and. <laughs> Uh, the release of the record is basically as a promotional tool. Yeah, what would happen is uh, the live performance was where you made your money, plus you would buy records from them and then sell them in the clubs. Okay. So there was another way to make money. Okay. Now, uh, I got one, I, 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 one of the things you can talk about, uh, I guess London Records, we, uh, one, one of the copies, that you sent me original copy of uh, the Rainfall's first album, and uh, on one side is uh, the recording quality is great, but the other side it was it was it was terrible. It was a bad pressing or something like that. We used to buy the records so we could sell them from London Records. Um, the first one we got, and we sent to DJs and everything. It was we were selling them great. Second group that we asked for the second pressing, something went wrong in the pressing, and like one side of it. Um, it's like the music was in the background, the singing, and the singing was way in the background. It lost a lot of quality, uh, and to this day, I don't remember whatever happened with that. Whether they corrected it, uh, because by that time we were approaching the time of releasing our our next uh, album, and I believe that's maybe what helped push the next album because of that defect. Because radio DJs were sending us back copies saying, I'm sorry, we can't play this, we'd love to play this song, it's on the charts, but it's unplayable because it's all... Uh, because of the poor... The, poor, uh, the quality poor. is just, you could barely hear the singing, so it must have been in the pressing. Yeah. Now, uh, on the Rainfall's first album, is this, this is all studio players that you had on this? Oh yeah, it was all studio players in Montreal. Yeah. Um, I remember one, the producer of it was Doogie Trenier. I noticed his name in the paper not long ago. He's still doing some of that. Okay. But, but <laughs> not in the old days. No, <laughs> no, he's still uh, doing still some recording. Yeah. But I do not remember the, the musicians because they were the studio musicians for the, for Rodeo Records back then, or Melbourne. Re Melbourne was a, a branch of Rodeo Records. Yeah. Who owned uh, Melbourne Records? It was George Taylor. Okay. He lived in Cavan, Ontario. Okay. Which is. Uh, but he'd do a lot of his work in Montreal. Now that uh, that particular <coughs> radar, was it uh, that particular uh, record label? Was it mostly country uh, country acts or across the board? It was. There was a mix. Melbourne had a mixture of artists. Uh, the rodeo label was pure country, all country. When a lot of it was just straight guitar and that. But the Melbourne label was a bit more, uh, and it was also a bit more expensive. The rodeo label was like dollar ninety eight or two ninety eight. And the Melbourne at the time was around five dollars, <coughs> and uh, it was more for the established acts, I guess you would call it. I don't know. Okay, yeah, let's. Uh, the, your second uh, release or album release for the Rainbows. Look over here. Uh, was the Polar Bear Express? Yeah, it was. Uh, <clears throat> I don't remember the year that was released. Approximately maybe seventy-one or seventy-two. Uh, and the first release from that album was the, the song Polar Bear Express also. Uh, that song didn't go quite as high on the charts because it was a bit more locally, but the song did very well. The uh, Polar Bear Express trained people, they used it for a video. So they, the, their promotion on, on TV commercials was that song. So for two or three years that song was being played a lot on TV. So. The uh, royalty was the highest of all the songs we had done because of the TV. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think about that word. Uh, after that, we didn't re they did we didn't put out another release because at that time is when George Taylor asked us uh, to book across Canada also because they were paying the shot for the releases and they wanted us to book across Canada. So we looked into it. But the fees we would get for those bookings were about half of the fees we were already making for booking. So it became a survival thing. It's much better to, we want to be with our family besides. So you never did any uh, mm -hmm. touring outside of uh, no, Quebec, Ontario, and, uh, and the uh, Northern States. Yeah, Northern we States. We didn't go out. They wanted us to go out west to help promote it because it's very country, but it would have meant traveling a lot and it would have been strictly for booking or for uh, promoting. 
the money would not have been about half and you have to make a living. Yeah. So that becomes either you have your choice of go for it or take care of your family and that has to be more important, you know. Okay, so uh, how did the whole Polar Bear Express uh, album start? It was it basically a, a dot song and then it, how, how, how did it start? We were playing music up in Cochrane a lot. Of, some of our bookings, we'd go back there about every six to eight weeks, we'd be at a two week booking at a, a place called a spinning wheel. And every time we'd play there, it would, the place would fill up. <coughs> Excuse me, the place would fill up. So we, we got to really enjoy the place. We were, we were also helping to raise money for a wing, of a, adding a wing to the hospital. So we were promoting that a lot, a lot, every place we went and tried to help out. And, um, that we were, they were very happy with us, and we got to like the town. So, I forget but the Polar Bear Express was an interesting thing, and we saw the train go by with a big Polar Bear Express on it. And my wife started. Uh, you know, we took the trip up the Polar Bear Express, and saw all these little towns, little very small villages with funny mm -hmm. names. So she got all the pamphlets, and we studied them, and she sat down one day and wrote a song. As a matter of fact, there's something funny about this. We were we had left Cochrane that night. We were driving home to come home, and she got the idea for the song. <clears throat> so tur we turned on the light in the car, and she's sitting there writing the song. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. police stops us. What are you doing? How come your light is on inside? You can't very, you can't see driving very well if your inside light is on. Well, the first thing when he's when he came to us, he says, oh, the rain veils. What are you doing? You know, why the light on? And she explained, we're writing the song. I just got an idea for a song. Uh, and he said, How well, did he know? The, how did the cop know you were the rain veils? Well, ones? because they were from the area. We were known in that area. Oh, okay, okay. We play uh, Iroquois Falls a lot. Okay, we okay. Play, so the cop recognized it? Yeah. Okay. We played a lot of those areas. So uh, right then he, 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 he knew what we were doing because she, here's a song, you know. So he said, well, please finish up later, but don't drive with your light on. He says, it's too hard to see. That's all that happened. But that's where, that's how the song came about. <clears throat> so the, the album started out as that song that was written that night? Is that yeah. No, no, no. The, that was written a few, a couple of years before. Okay. But because we were playing during those times, the song came about. And then At the Wheel, which was another song, because we used to go at the wheel all the time, and we got to like the mic and all the people who who owned the wheel and so we <clears throat> we cheered that one too and a lot of the songs were written on the way home or then when we get home we'd work on those songs and practice them so next time we go in the next booking we'd be playing them in the club now how long how long did it take for that album to come together the polar bear express was it was it recorded over a uh, space of time two, two days <clears throat> very fast the musicians were very good what they did uh, we only had about four or five originals. In other words, to save money, what the companies were doing, I guess a lot of that, which I don't know how legal it is, but <clears throat> they would play, they would record three or four, maybe five of our own songs, and then they would uh, take out songs they had already done for other artists in the past two or three or four years. They would just leave out the singing and ask us if we knew the song. The words, then they would already have the music, so they would send their musicians home. The music they are already done. So, you know, so these are backing tracks. That, uh, yeah, the backing tracks. Okay. They had already paid once to get those backing tracks and didn't have to pay the musicians over again. So, they would use a lot of these backing tracks, like a karaoke almost. So we would sing to it. Yeah. Now this was another Melbourne's re release. Uh, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now. Uh, uh, was Melbourne doing a lot of this? Where they were, uh, for example, with uh, you were covering uh, Fogarty or CCR at the time. Were they were, were they doing a lot of covers of uh, mainstream acts? Ninety percent was covers. Almost all rodeo label was covers. They would take all the main the main uh, hits and cover them on rodeo. <clears throat> Melbourne had not quite as many covers; had more original. But. Uh, on the other one, on the rodeo, it was mostly covers. Uh, so uh, I noticed that some of the rainfalls, uh, there was a, a few uh, CCR covers. Were you a CCR fan, or that was oh, just yeah. a, okay? That was we, okay. Yeah, I love that. We always loved their style, so we always used to do their songs, uh, like bootleg and 
they're a very bluesy kind of, it, I feel it's, there's country but with a real blues edge to them. So you can play with those songs and really, you know, have a lot of fun with doing the song. Okay, Mo, I, 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 did, I, I detect a little hint of a, a French-Canadian accent there. Uh, have you done any uh, uh, songs uh, 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 recorded in French? Anything? Yeah, I did one. I wrote one called <coughs> Je suis allé en Ontario. It was kind of a tongue-in-cheek at the time. Uh, uh, back in, in, the, in those days, <coughs> the, uh, the fifth, uh, you know, the Labatt's 50 was a very popular in this area. And so I wrote the song was about somebody from Gas Bay um, coming to Sudbury to work in the mines, but he was drinking too much 50, and he ended up getting fired because he was making, missing too many shifts. And as the song goes, he went back home, <coughs> and uh, his mom says, uh, no, his dad says, how did it go? Well, he says, they're not very busy in the summer, and the word for summer is ite, so it all matches again. They're not busy in the summer. That's why they didn't need me. And his mother says, wait, Johnny, did, tell me the truth. Did you drink too much 50? Did they, did they fire you? And <laughs> in other words, in the song is the mother knew, she knew, you know. Uh, so it's a funny, it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek laugh. Yeah. Now, with your live performances, were, uh, when you would do your, uh, 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 your gigs in uh, Quebec, we, we, would it be strictly as a French show? No, and no, no. But we did, uh, we did quite a few French songs, and Dot had learned, uh, she was doing the French song, Quand le Soleil, and also a lot of the old French songs, country songs I had learned back in the 50s, she would do harmony to me. What I, we did is, <clears throat> in other words, I'd write the words down, the French words would be written as if they were English words. It's very easy to do. You just put all the French words and make them, make the spelling like it's an English word. So when the person is reading those, what looks like English words, to the listener it sounds like French. So she was able to learn a lot of songs that way. Uh, uh, Dot is not French Canadian then? No. Oh, okay. Oh, I just naturally assumed that you were both French. Okay. No, no. Okay. No, because when, when I met her she couldn't. She couldn't understand French, and I couldn't understand English. Oh, okay. Kind of, okay, that's <laughs> a, that's a, that, that, that's good, uh, good story.